Okay, so good afternoon. This is our second session of our public pre-K technical assistance series. Um, it's a ongoing conversation around high quality practices in public pre-K programs. Um, we've met once and talked about the application process and we'll continue conversations today. Um, and I'll dive into the topics in just a few moments. I did wanna take just a minute and let some of our early learning team members introduce themselves. So I'm Nicole Medor. I'm the early childhood specialist here at the department. And I think Leanne's here as well. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to have you. I'm Leanne Larson. I'm the coordinator for the early learning team in the Department of Ed. And Marcy's joining us. She's on the phone. But Marcy, did you want to introduce yourself real quick if you have service? Sure, thanks, Nicole. Hi, everybody. I'm Marcy Whitcomb. I am the uh, program monitor for early childhood programs with the early learning team. Thanks. And I'm in my car, so I apologize you can't see me. <laughs> All good. And Nina's here with us today. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Nina Cunningham, the Head Start State Collaboration Director in the early learning team. Nina and Jane is here today. Hello, everyone. My name is Jane. I'm the contract grant specialist for the pre-K pre grant expansion. Thank you. So full team here today. It's great. Um, so those of you that have had access already know, those that don't, uh, this link here, this bit.ly link will bring you to a resource document. It's actually actually a Google Doc. Um, so there's some information about this series and some resources that are linked directly on that document. Um, so you can go ahead and manually type in that link, um, or you should have received it in an email when you registered for this as well. So there's some different ways there. And that is a live document. Um, our team continues to add to it as resources become available. Um, so feel free to access it throughout this whole series and into the summer and well beyond because things will be updated as needed right on that on that resource. Um, today's agenda is fairly quick. We'll review the topics, um, identify some documents and where the, they might be located if necessary for the topics, and then certainly offer time for any discussion or questions. With that in mind, feel free to interrupt me at any point via chat or come off mute and just um, jump right in. I'm happy to answer any uh, clarifying questions that you might have as they come up. And that goes for uh, folks on my team as well. So if you think I've missed something or, or want to add on to any of the conversation, please do. Our topics for today include three things. The first one being your community needs and identifying those. And then we'll talk briefly about recruitment for your four-year-olds into the pre-K program. And then we'll talk about some enrollment and transition strategies. Um, these transitions, the topic today is really specific to coming into pre-K, but our team's done a lot of work also in transitioning students from pre-K into kindergarten. So if you have a, or work in a school where public pre-K is already up and running, then certainly um, I would implore you to check out the resources we have for kindergarten transitions as well. Um, but for today's information, we'll focus specifically on coming into the pre-K space. Okay, we'll hop right to the top, community needs. So we get asked um, often about community needs and how schools and school districts might identify what those needs are. And there are some expectations that we at the department have that are requirements, right? They're outlined in chapter 124 in section 12.01. But then there's also a lot of strategies and things that schools and communities could be doing that aren't necessarily required, but our team would strongly recommend schools do some of these practices as well, um, just to further understand, you know, the families in your community and the needs that they might have for care and education. So we split them out here. So the requirements are, are shorter, you can see. So the first thing that chapter 124 calls out is that anytime a school <laughs> starts pre-K or expands pre-K and has to fill in the application, we ask that you show and demonstrate coordination with other early childhood programs in your community. 
And that obviously varies greatly across the state of Maine. So some communities are small or smaller and don't have as many child care centers or family child cares um, or before and after school programs, rec programs, summer camps, things like that. But certainly some of our larger communities do have more of a variety um, of programs in your community. So first and foremost, just sort of uh, identifying coordination with the agencies that already exist in your space, in your catchment area. Um, there is a website through Main Roads to Quality that I'm just thinking of now that would be a good resource to add to that document um, that can sort of help you identify what is already licensed in your area and is already providing some level of care and education to young students and their families. Um, so I'll make sure that we add that to the document. But once you've demonstrated coordination through phone calls, through letters, um, emails, what have you, we want to make sure that you sort of track those efforts because, <clears throat> excuse me, on the application form itself, it asks about that specifically. Excuse me just a moment. Frog in my throat. <clears throat> it asks about what those efforts were. So many times we'll get um, minutes for meetings, for example, or We'll get a list of the dates that you offered for meetings or for face to face or virtual meetings. We'll get evidence of letters that you sent via mail, <coughs> excuse me, or email, things like that. Really, it's, a, it's showing us that your program wants to operate in its best efforts possible in terms of communication and relationships with who is already existing in your space, right? <laughs> it's hard for families to argue with free when a school is offering a free program. So we wanna make sure that schools know who else in your community interacts with the same families and how can we facilitate those relationships in a positive way. And then of course, you'll have to provide public notice <clears throat> regarding your program's proposal to the community. So those things we expect to see. And the other spectrum of that is the community needs that we recommend, we strongly recommend you do in order to offer the best possible program for your community. So the first thing that you could do is survey your community for their needs of care and education. So typically this is gonna go straight to families, right? And asking them, really sort of directly, what do you need for your young child? Do you need full day programming? <clears throat> do you need before and after care? Um, do you already access child care? Things like that. And then of course, with any data collection, we want to evaluate that and use the results of the data to form and meet the needs of what it's telling you. So if the families in your community really don't need to access full day care, but would prefer to have half day, um, or would prefer to have full day, but not full week or what have you. Really analyzing that and, and designing your program to meet those needs and those gaps of care um, <clears throat> will really behoove you. Of course, we'll design your program to meet the majority of needs so that you can fill your seats. And then we also talk to schools about considering what your kindergarten enrollment numbers are and using that as sort of a guide or an estimation for what your incoming four-year-olds, what the number of incoming four-year-olds might be. And then you may or may not have the space already to accommodate all of them. So you may need to make some decisions around your programming based on how many students you can accept. And then assure that your communication strategies with families and with community folks are, of course, culturally responsive and accessible. I'm going to pause there for just a minute and see if there's anything else that folks want to add or ask. I'll grab some water. <clears throat> Thank you, Nina. I saw in the chat box you added the um, link for Main Roads to Quality that I mentioned um, 
around finding out who's licensed in your area. So that would be a, a great resource too. I have a question, Nicole. Yeah. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on the providing public notice piece? Yes. Yep, so that's a requirement in chapter 124. So once a school has determined what they're going to offer in terms of, you know, program hours, how many seats will be available, the location, <clears throat> decisions like that, <clears throat> then we ask that they formally notify the community about that, right? So it might go out in a social media post or a letter home, a newsletter, things like that, <clears throat> notifying folks of the final decision that's made in terms of what will be offered. Nicole, you may be gonna talk about this next, I'm not sure, but I know one of the links that's built into the document, I believe is an example of a community needs survey. Yes, <clears throat> and actually I have that pulled up, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Let me just end this really quickly. <clears throat> so on the form that I mentioned was a bit.ly link in the beginning. Just take a second to upload here. On today's session, <clears throat> community needs recruitment and enrollment. The very first link is a sample community survey. <clears throat> and what this link does is it will, when you click on it, which I'll do in just a second, It'll ask you if you want to make a copy of this survey, and then that way you'll be able to have editing rights <clears throat> and nobody else will have access to your version. That'll be um, just true to you. And then you can edit it to be specific for <clears throat> your community and your school and the language and whatnot. So you'll just go ahead and make a copy of that document. <clears throat> right now it's set up as a, like a Google survey. <clears throat> that may or may not suit your school's needs so but at least the language is um, an idea and gives you kind of a starting point. So we use the language of Maine Department of Education. <clears throat> and this just gives you a sample introduction email for um, <clears throat> outreach. The name of the school that they would access <clears throat> if there's more than one option in an SAU ages of the children in the household, current, are they already currently enrolled? And then it goes on to identify some more specifics around that enrollment if the answer was yes. How often are they accessing those programs? Um, you could ask about cost and, and what families are paying. This would be handy if you're considering partnerships with these locations what the families have access to for childcare. <clears throat> you know, and these aren't, again, <clears throat> this is a, a recommended strategy for gaining under, a better understanding of your community's needs. So none of these questions that are here are must have. They're, they're just samples and that you'll, once you've made a copy of this year, <clears throat> you can edit and rearrange to better suit your, your needs. Uh, the idea sort of being that it's the families that are responding to it. So you'll want to make sure that the way you word things <clears throat> meet the needs of the family in terms of how they respond to it. And then you can easily add more questions or take some questions up. <clears throat> so that link is, is here on that document, resource document. <clears throat> Lovely time for a frog at my throat. <clears throat> okay. Okay, I'll move us along quickly to recruitment. So <clears throat> when you get an, a better understanding of what you're going to offer in terms of hours per week, <clears throat> how many students, classrooms, etc., then you're going to want to start the recruitment process. And this is really specific to the needs of your individual community. So again, there's no right or wrong recruitment strategy. Certainly, we're all familiar with ones that are common. And some communities have really unique ways that they recruit for their students. One way that a lot of our smaller communities <clears throat> find their four-year-olds is by coordinating with their town office. So it's not unheard of for 
secretaries or admin in the school to call the local town office and say how many children were born in 2017 2018 who would be four years old now <clears throat> who, you know how many can i have their contact information you know whatever that your town office is, is able to provide you certainly in our larger communities that's an unwielding task that nobody wants to take on so we need to find other ways to recruit our students <clears throat> I mentioned before looking at your primary grade enrollment so k3 and seeing sort of what those class sizes are typically um, so that you sort of have a ballpark understanding of how many four-year-olds we might be talking about if you're not a universal program and you can't accept all four-year-olds <clears throat> then of course if you can only take 16 students then your recruitment strategies um, will be it might be a little different so many programs put notices out into the community, um, postings on <clears throat> digital boards, actual you know, flyers at stores, at doctor's offices, things like that. If you have a partner agency that you're working with, <clears throat> you'll definitely wanna work with them because they may have strategies or requirements depending on you know, how they have to recruit st students. <coughs> Another strategy is specific outreach to community agencies. So calling doctor's offices, calling um, child cares, calling if you have transportation agencies, whatever it may be, other, other areas in your worlds that interact with the same age groups, <clears throat> libraries, for example. Certainly word of mouth and social media. Um, those are, are two big ones that I, we know a lot of schools utilize now. And I was curious if any other folks on today had ideas or strategies that you've used in the past that are successful. So feel free to share those now. I'm just going to pause for a minute. <clears throat> no, <clears throat> the first time that I visited a really small community in the northeastern part of our state and I was asking them about their you know how did you find your four-year-olds how do you recruit them <clears throat> and that they were the ones that first mentioned to me that they coordinate with their town office and I thought that was such a unique way <clears throat> that I had never considered before and she said oh our secretary just calls so-and-so at the town office and she gives them the name of the four-year-olds that were born <laughs> And we call their their families <laughs> like oh that seems like such an obvious thing to do that is just not possible across the state um if other ideas or strategies do come up i'm always interested to hear them um i know marcy is as well i can speak for her because we've had this conversation before um because we love to share those ideas with other schools and other folks that are um, looking to expand their program so certainly feel free to share them at a later date if they come up <clears throat> and then the last two things are enrollment and transition. So we've designed our program, we let the community know, and we've started recruiting <clears throat> for students to join us. So now we're going to start talking about enrolling those students. So certainly you're going to have a registration process. Oftentimes that mirrors the kindergarten registration as far as packets, paperwork, information that needs to be collected what have you <clears throat> and if you have those at your school parents can pick them up um, or you, they can op often option to have them mailed home whatever works for you <clears throat> but if you're not a universal program meaning you have more four-year-olds in your community than you have space to accommodate in your schools right this is not uncommon most of our programs in maine are not universal <clears throat> like kindergarten is, right? There's a student that wants to attend kindergarten, they could typically sign up and there's a space for them. <clears throat> That's not always true for pre-K. So we really encourage districts to be considerate of an enrollment policy for non-universal programs. So you, you don't have space for everybody. Be really clear about how you're going to choose who becomes enrolled and who perhaps doesn't will you maintain a wait list for example things like that and whatever decision is made we ask that you 
are really clear with families during the registration process of how you are going to enroll them, right? So there's no surprises after the fact. We don't want parents registering their students for pre-K only to find out shortly after <clears throat> that their student wasn't accepted because of space issues, right? So being really clear and upfront as soon as possible um, is going to be in your best interest. So there are some things that we <clears throat> encourage folks to consider. Your enrollment policy should clearly document the number of students that can be enrolled. <clears throat> and of course, the process that the SAU will take to identify those students. So if you're opening up two classrooms and then you have 32 students who can be enrolled. <clears throat> Programs should also make every effort to serve the community's most vulnerable populations with a heterogeneous mix of students. <clears throat> so in our larger communities, we know that students come from a variety of different backgrounds and a variety of different experiences. And they all bring those really unique experiences to the table when they come to pre-K. <clears throat> so we want a good mix of that present. So there's a few ways <clears throat> that that can sort of be broken down. When we say that we're referring to children's developmental abilities, their family's economic status, their family's culture and or language needs, etc. So getting a good mix of students can be done in a variety of ways. In our guidebook in Appendix B, <clears throat> there's a written example of what schools might consider saying in an enrollment policy. Again, totally unique to the school <clears throat> and it can certainly be edited. Leanne, would you mind describing this next slide? I really need to get some water. <laughs> I will do my best, Nicole. <laughs> so this is an example of um, program eligibility criteria that an SAU or school might put in place for their students. So as you can see at the top, um, one of the requirements that's absolutely a requirement that you can't get around is that students must be four years of age by October 15th in order to be enrolled. If they will not be um, age four by October 15th, then they are not eligible for pre-K in that year. They would have to wait till the following year. Um, in um, this example, there are um, situations where a school, because they cannot serve all of their students, would potentially set up a lottery because Lotteries are one mechanism that schools could use to try to make decisions about who's going to be um, able to participate in the program and, and to try to keep it as fair as possible. Um, but even within a lottery system, it's important for schools to be thinking if they're going to reach um, that mix of a heterogeneous population and be responsible, responsive to some of the vulnerable populations that they're trying to serve, you can set up um, within your lottery a certain number of slots for particular populations of students. So one population that's really important to try to serve are students that may have an IEP in place already. And it may be documented in their IEP that a placement in a public pre-K program would be the least restrictive environment for that child. And that's a population that you want to try to serve. Um, certainly students who um, are, um, or would be eligible for free and reduced lunch um, are at an economic disadvantage are another population of students that you wanna make sure that you're trying to reach. Students who are multilingual learners may also be another population within your community. We recommend that one way to think about how many spaces you might want to allocate um, within the number of spaces you have available is to look at your K-12 population and to think about how you might mirror the current um, percentages of students that fall into some of these different populations and then divide up the slots that are available um, with that in mind so that you're making sure that you're being responsive to the needs of your community. 
Did you have more, Nicole, you would like to add? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. No, that was great. Um, <laughs> You're you doing great hanging the in there. <laughs> you touched on all the uh, main points that I was going to bring up as well. Again, this is just a sample enrollment policy. <clears throat> the way that your school decides to um, enroll could look a little different depending on the needs and the space that you have available. But certainly, um, this could provide a starting point for folks to have those conversations and, and create those policies around. Nicole, if I might add just one piece around um, enrollment, <clears throat> if you're partnering with a certain partner who has specific enrollment requirements, that will be um, will need to be a consideration prior to kind of developing your own um, enrollment policy. So just keeping that um, at the forefront. Yes, thank you. And another common conversation that isn't um, highlighted here or, or um, in this Appendix B of the guidebook is one around having multiple pre-K classrooms across your district. So having one or two classrooms in this school and another classroom in that school and what the availability is perhaps for parents to access a classroom in a school building that might not be there home school, for example. Um, so just kind of giving you a heads up around <clears throat> there might be a request or some accommodation that needs to be made because of transportation or because of a family's choice or their before and after care where that's located, things like that. <clears throat> so having that in the back of your mind in terms of how you'll situate your students and, and balance classrooms that way to accommodate transportation and families requests. Uh, if you do choose to hold a wait list, um, you know, how will that be determined um, and, and how will it be accessed if the seat becomes available? All of those things um, are important conversation pieces to have. So we've looked at our community. Um, we've talked about recruiting our students. Here we've talked about enrolling them. <clears throat> and then the next final piece is getting them situated as the school year starts to approach transitioning the child and the family into your space. <clears throat> so again, this particular piece is pulled from the guidebook and just in, uh, encouraging and reiterating that attention to transitions into programs and between classrooms does set a positive tone for future experiences with teachers and families <clears throat> and it sets children up for a successful outlook for school in general. So we um, do ask that you, in the application process, identify some transition strategies that you hope to implement. <clears throat> now, when the transition, excuse me, when the application is due, that's usually much sooner than transitions might typically begin. <clears throat> so whatever you put into your application is just that. It's almost always what you anticipate to do. However, once you've got folks enrolled and you've started interacting with the families, you may find a need to alter your strategies depending on how comfortable families are accessing your school and accessing your program or not, right? And sort of understanding and learning um, that relationship dynamic and, and wanting to provide everything possible to make the transition as smooth as possible. No two families are the same, right? There's unique needs among all of us that uh, one strategy will work really well for one family, but maybe not as well <clears throat> for another. We have some really um, common sort of, you know, I don't know how to, I don't want to say surface level, but some really basic and introductory transition ideas here. But what I really want to stress is, again, there are so many ways to transition families into a pre-K classroom that go above and beyond what we'll list really quickly here. So please don't take these as must-haves. These are simply to get sort of the juices flowing and start thinking about these ideas. And there um, are a lot of examples of schools throughout Maine who do many different things um, that work for them. So really be open to thinking outside the box. <clears throat> So many times we see schools that organize visits to the classroom um, and with the teachers, right? So if you've got your staff already up in there um, prior to the first day of school, sometimes this has already started now. A lot of schools in the next month or so <clears throat> will start to plan their screenings, their incoming child find screenings. And that's a great opportunity to have students and families come in, 
see the space, meet the teachers, et cetera. However, as the summer comes to an end and the new school year starts, it's another great opportunity to offer um, visits and, and introductory um, interactions with teachers prior to the first day of school. A lot of schools too will um, delay the first day of school for pre-K. They might start after Labor Day or at least after kindergarten has started. Um, and so that's a good sort of time frame too to continue transition strategies. Um, another one, another idea to consider is to meet with families to discuss um, their home language, their preferred communication methods, any transition concerns or supports that they can identify for you, <clears throat> any um, IEP services that may be in referral process or already happening, any health considerations for children and program information. A lot of this will be provided through the registration process on paper which is great, but following up with a phone call or a virtual visit um, can really help to sort of better understand uh, the needs of the families that they may, uh, may have identified on paper. Ensure that any dual language families have information in their preferred language and that it's um, they're supported during the uh, registration process necessary. <clears throat> Schedule and notify parents of screening days, including developmental and behavioral and hearing and vision screenings. Again, some schools do that now in the spring, other schools wait until um, the end of summer and beginning of the school year. Win-win, uh, um, it's completely up to the school and, and the staffing needs and, and timing needs of, of that location. We highly recommend that you contact CDS for any students that might have an IEP so you can gain information and scheduling of services for children with current IEP plans so everybody's on the same page coming in. And then again, other ideas and strategies. So I know um, if you're partnering with another agency, they may already have um, processes in place that you want to continue or you want to support. You know, um, Head Start often will provide home visits or meet with families somewhere in a agreed space in the community and start those conversations of um, what pre-K is going to be like and what families can expect when they come in. Um, but certainly if there are others like before, feel free to um, send them to us at any time so we can share. The link at the bottom, um, the early childhood slash transitions, that's the work that I mentioned um, that really focuses on transitioning students from pre-K into kindergarten. Um, so I, I didn't want to leave that out because there's a lot of great information and resources there. Certainly it can be applied to incoming pre-K students, um, but we highly encourage folks to have that resource available um, come kindergarten transition as well. <clears throat> uh, my team, anything I left out or that you wanted to add here? I would maybe just add, Nicole, that um, it, when you have opportunity, obviously, to have connections with families, this could happen at screening. It could happen through, you know, email communication or something that's mailed home. Some schools find it helpful to have some kind of a parent survey piece embedded that gives families a chance to give teachers some information about their children. What are some of the things their child really likes? How, what are good strategies to use that my child responds to? What some things that it would be helpful for you to know about my child? Some of my wishes um, and, and hopes. Um, and that can be a really welcoming um, piece for families to receive. But as Nicole mentioned, be really sensitive to um, language load for families. Make sure that it's written in a way that's um, accessible, and especially if it's a family um, that speaks another first language, um, you may need to think about translation or an opportunity um, to have just an oral conversation with families to gather some of that information. Okay, and this slide pretty much wraps up the um, topics that we had planned for today. I do have time uh, left available for any questions um, 
Oh, that's a funny way of putting that up there. Um, <clears throat> any questions now? We're happy to, to stick around and have conversations are over. Um, but certainly any of our emails listed here, please contact us at any time with any of your clarifications needed. Um, any one of us are, are happy to help. So um, our next meeting is scheduled for May 9th. Um, and we'll be talking about community partnerships and partnering with agencies that um, already exist um, to provide pre-K programming. So uh, we'll certainly chat deeper into those topics. Nicole, I just wanted to add one thing, if I could, or yes, two things. Um, you talked about our transition website, which is awesome. Um, and Leanne was talking about like a family interview sort of it's kind of like a one pager, but we did put a sample together that is on the family resources link on that website. And there are a couple other samples as well um, that are good for, you know, communicating with families and working together with other providers of children who may come into your program. So I just wanted to let you know that those samples were there also. Thank you. Mike.